I'm Merlin Burt, Director of the Center for Adventist Research and LNG White Estate Branch Office uh, here at Andrews University, and also a professor in, in church history in the area of Adventist Studies and Ellen White Studies in the Church History Department of the Seventh-day Adventist Theological Seminary. This presentation is titled Ellen White and the Personhood of the Holy Spirit. And we want to spend a few minutes looking at the doctrine of the Holy Spirit as it relates to um, what Ellen White wrote and the development of Adventist understanding in relationship to the uh, Godhead and deity and personhood of the Holy Spirit. There really is no Christian doctrine more fundamental than the doctrine of God. Uh, the Seventh-day Adventist biblical understanding of the Trinity helps us to understand uh, the revealed nature, attributes, and character of God. The last 15 years or so has seen a, an increased interest in study and examination of the doctrine of the Trinity, and I would like to emphasize here for Seventh-day Adventists we would say the biblical doctrine of the Trinity, uh, which is not necessarily the same as some others view, other Christian groups view on the Trinity, including the Catholic Church. They may use the term Trinity, but that when they use that term, their understanding of the Trinity is not necessarily the same as the Seventh-day Adventist understanding of the Trinity. But the last 15 years has seen an increased discussion in the Church on the issue of the full Godhead of Jesus. Is He fully divine, original, underived, like the Father? Is He e totally equal and equivalent? Some have said no. Um, we will not take time in this presentation to discuss Jesus. We're looking at the Holy Spirit. Uh, less has been written on the history of Ellen White and the Adventist understanding of the Holy Spirit. More has been written upon Jesus and His deity. And so the purpose of this presentation is to try to look more closely at the personhood of the Holy Spirit in Adventist history and in Ellen White's writings. Ellen White's writings are particularly rich in regard to the Holy Spirit. She refers to the Holy Spirit tens of thousands of times in both her published and unpublished writings. In fact, she refers to the Holy Spirit almost as often as Jesus. More studies on Ellen White and the Holy Spirit would be useful, and I would hope that we could look in the future at maybe Ellen White and the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the work of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit in salvation, the Holy Spirit in evangelism and mission, the charismatic experience in the Holy Spirit. These are all interesting topics. But today we want to particularly look at the personhood of the Holy Spirit. Before we talk specifically about Ellen White, it would be helpful, I think, to take a little while to talk about the history of the Adventist understanding of the Holy Spirit. Uh, the first period is this period up to about 1890 or into the 1890s. Um, Adventists who uh, formed the Seventh-day Adventist Church uh, tended to be anti-Trinitarian in their view during the decades before the 1890s. Um, they inherited this view largely from the denominations they had come from. I'm thinking particularly of James White and Joseph Bates. Uh, with Ellen White, these three were the principal founders of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and both James White and Joseph Bates came from the Christian Connection uh, movement, which generally was anti-Trinitarian. So they came to Adventism, and they came to the Seventh-day Adventist Church when they formed it with this view. And um, the Holy Spirit, an understanding of the Holy Spirit, uh, was impacted as well by this view. Briefly, the view that became the settled Seventh-day Adventist view up to around 1890 was the understanding that God the Father was God in all senses divine. The Son, Jesus, was also fully divine, but that He was begotten, or He came forth from the Father at some point in eternity, and that He was like a son. So He had the same nature, much as my sons, I have two sons, 
have my nature fully and entirely, but they are derived from me. Um, early Adventists up to about 1890 believed that Jesus was derived from the Father in a begotten sense. So still fully God, but uh, originated from the Father. The understanding of the Holy Spirit was, was more dramatic because most early Adventists rejected the personality of the Holy Spirit. They did not believe that the Holy Spirit was a person. Um, instead, they viewed the Holy Spirit as a manifestation of the presence of either the Father or the Son. Now, their thinking of this is important to understand. And I'm just going to give a little background before I go into uh, what some of the individuals said in, in our history. Um, they saw the Father and the Son as persons, material beings in a sense. Yes, spiritual um, maybe not having flesh like we have, particularly the Father, but still a being. And in their thinking, a being could be in one place. And so God the Father is somewhere there in heaven. And Jesus is there, or He was here on earth, or He's somewhere else. So how is God omnipresent? How is God able to be everywhere? Well, this was their understanding of the Holy Spirit. Somehow the Holy Spirit was the way that the Father or the Son manifested their presence in all places. And so they saw the Holy Spirit not as a person, but as a manifestation of, of the Father or the Son and their communication, their connection somehow with us. And so this idea of not having a personal Holy Spirit in the sense of him being a person was generally believed up to the 1890s. In 1877, J.H. Wagner wrote of the Holy Spirit, uh, referring to the Holy Spirit as an it rather than a he. After writing uh, of, of, quote, one question that has been much controverted, close quote, he's continued, the personality of the Holy Spirit, he said that the Spirit was, quote, that awful and mysterious power which proceeds from the throne of the universe. So again, it's this manifestation of the Father or the Son. In 1878, Uriah Smith wrote, What is the Holy Spirit? And then he answered, quote, In a word, it may perhaps best be described as a mysterious influence emanating from the Father and the Son, their representative and the medium of their power. Again, the same thought that I've been describing here. In 1878, D.M. Canwright wrote extensively on the Holy Spirit, actually for a few years there, and he was most strident on this issue. He wrote, the Holy Spirit is not a person, not an individual, but is an influence or power proceeding from the Godhead. In 1889, M.C. Wilcox, who was one of the editors of the Signs of the Times, wrote these words of the Holy Spirit. God's power, separate from His personal presence, is manifested through His Spirit. So again, there is not a, the Holy Spirit is not personal being uh, in what's being said here. Some speculated that the Holy Spirit might be an angel, or in some class as the angels, but most Adventists rejected this idea. So you have some speculation, but generally they reject this idea. In representing the idea of how God could be omnipresent, Wilcox, as late as 1898, asked this rhetorical question. But God is a person. How can his life be everywhere present? And then he continues. God is everywhere present by his spirit. And then went on to explain that the Holy Spirit was an aura that extends beyond a person, sort of the Father's person. It's the way of somehow him putting his presence out there. And so again, we have this view. In the 1890s, though, you do see a shift taking place. Um, R.A. Underwood wrote, The Holy Spirit is God's personal representative in the field. Christ's personal representative in the field. And he is charged with the work of meeting Satan and defeating this personal enemy of God and his government. And then he says, it seems strange to me now 
that I ever believed that the Holy Spirit was only an influence in view of the work he does. Now, Underwood wrote this in 1898. So you see, by this year, you still have M.C. Wilcox talking about the aura, and you have Underwood talking about, I can't believe that I didn't think he was a person. So, as in an understanding of the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, we find that, um, just like the doctrine of the personality of Jesus, the 1890s was a transition period, so in the same way we have the doctrine of the Holy Spirit uh, having a transition period in the 1890s. Uh, in the shift um, towards an understanding of the personhood of the Holy Spirit, A.T. Jones wrote, this is in 1907, the Holy Spirit is a person. This great truth is not recognized. Indeed, it is not believed by more than a very few, even of Christians. For everybody knows that almost invariably, and with very, very few exceptions, the Holy Spirit is referred to and spoken of by Christians as it. The Holy Spirit is not an influence, not an impression, not peace, not joy, nor anything. The Holy Spirit gives peace and gives joy, assuages and griefs, makes an impression, exerts an influence, but the Holy Spirit is none of these things nor any other thing. No, eternally, no. The Holy Spirit is a person, and he puts it in italics. He's emphasizing it. Eternally a divine person, and he must be always recognized and spoken of as a person, or he is not truly recognized or spoken of at all. Close quotes. So, A.T. Jones, who influences the church in understanding the personhood and eternal deity of Jesus, is also emphasizing the importance of the personhood and deity of of the Holy Spirit. Of course, this is in 1907, some years later. So this is a brief overview of some of the statements up to the 1890s that shows that our Adventist pioneers generally didn't believe in the person of the Holy Spirit, but then in the 1890s it begins to shift to where the Holy Spirit is seen to be as a person as well as um, um, the omnipresence, influence of God working everywhere. What about Ellen White? This is where we need to spend a good deal of the rest of our time, is looking at what Ellen White has to say about the Holy Spirit. It seems that there is a bit of a division in Ellen White's own understanding between the pre-1890s period and the period of the 1890s and later. Um, she refrains before the 1890s of being explicit on the personhood of the Holy Spirit. Uh, her first clear and explicit statement on the personhood of the Holy Spirit, at least that I can find, is in 1893. And we'll look at that in a moment. Before that, though, Ellen White writes a great deal about the Holy Spirit, and she has kind of three orientations. Before I talk about those, I need to say something very, very important about Ellen White and her understanding of the Holy Spirit and really in her whole work in ministry. For Ellen White, Scripture is the most important thing. She, in her writings, is taking us to Scripture. She is going to Scripture. And in the absence of clear, direct divine revelation, she's always defaulting to Scripture and trying not to go beyond what Scripture says. This is true of the Holy Spirit. And even after she receives, makes clear statements on the personality of the Holy Spirit and His full deity, she still stays scriptural, and she takes people to Scripture. So before she has clear prophetic divine revelation from God, she is defaulting to Scripture. After she has clear Revelation from God, she's still taking, even though she's more explicit now, she's still taking us back, or taking the reader back to Scripture again as the basis and the orientation. So, as we look at the period up to the 1890s, we don't have her being explicit on the personhood of the Holy Spirit. You have some statements where it sounds like it. She refers to the Holy Spirit as an author. She refers to the Holy Spirit in a personified way. She talks about Jesus' baptism and how the Holy Spirit came down as a dove. And so she does have the biblical 
explanations that are given and she doesn't try to modify them or tweak them or change them or say something different about the personality of the Holy Spirit like some of the other pioneers did. There are three emphases that I see up to the 1890s that Ellen White has on the Holy Spirit. Um, the first one is that she emphasizes the personality of God. Now she leaves the Holy Spirit off. I already told you there's not too much on that. But she's emphasizing the personhood of the Father and the Son. That's what she's clear on. As early as 1845, uh, she uh, was shown in vision, I saw a throne and on it sat the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. I gazed on Jesus' countenance and admired His lovely person. The Father's person I could not behold, for a cloud of glorious light covered Him. I asked Jesus if His Father had a form like Himself. He said He had, but I could not behold it. For, said He, if you should for once see the glory of His person, you would cease to exist. So she's emphasizing the personhood of the Father and the Son. At this point, she refrains from making a statement like that about the Holy Spirit, but neither does she speak against the personhood of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Secondly, she sees the Holy Spirit as a practical, practical and demonstrable reality. Uh, the work of the Holy Spirit is very present and active in her own Christian experience and ministry. She received hundreds of prophetic visions and dreams, which she understood to come from the working and operation of the Holy Spirit. So she was very concrete and practical about the work of the Holy Spirit. In fact, when some were accusing her of her visions being mesmerism or just a type of hypnotism, she just utterly rejected that and said, no, it is the working of the Holy Spirit of God. She said it gave her keen anguish, well nigh to despair, that people viewed it this way. She went on and she said at one point, many would have me believe that there was no Holy Ghost and that all the exercises of the holy men of God have experienced were only mesmerism or deceptions of Satan. So in a practical, concrete sense, she's saying there is a Holy Ghost. So she is practically accepting the reality of the Holy Spirit and urging it and resisting anything that would counter this reality in her own experience and in what she was shown. In fact, at one point when she had some doubt herself about her visions and she resisted it, this is very early in her ministry, um, in that vision she was struck dumb and couldn't speak and God held up before her a golden card in vision and there were 50 texts on that card. And after she came out of vision, she went and read those texts. And God used Scripture to help her to a better understanding. Now, if you look at the texts, which she re replicates in the book Early Writings, all 50 of them, you find them there, a number of them relate to the work of the Holy Spirit. You would expect this because this is her question. This is one of her struggles. Is it mesmerism or is it really the power of God? And so God's way of helping her is to point her back to Scripture. And so the Holy Spirit is very much a concrete, tangible reality for her, even though she refrains from speaking clearly and explicitly about his personality. Finally, she tried to understand, number three here, this is the period up to 1890, she tried to understand the Holy Spirit as it was explained in Scripture. In the absence of clear revelation, she's always defaulting to Scripture. And even after, with clear revelation, she goes to Scripture. It was in 1891 that she had a very interesting experience. There was a man who was arguing some unusual views. He was a minister in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And two things that he was arguing was that the Holy Spirit was really the angel Gabriel. And that the 144,000... Uh, will all be Jews that acknowledge Jesus as the Messiah in the future. These were two views that he was pushing. Holy Spirit's an angel, 144,000 are the Jews who will acknowledge Jesus as Messiah. Now, in this letter that she writes in 1891, it's letter 7, 1891, 
She, through much of the letter, argues that he be in unity with his fellow believers, his fellow church ministers as well. She says, brethren should not feel that it is a virtue to stand apart because they do not see all minor points in exactly the same light. When there is difference of opinion on such points, the less prominence you give to them, the better it will be for your own spirituality and for the peace and unity that Christ prayed might exist among brethren. So she's giving some general principles about unity. And if you have some view that's creating disunity, if possible, just don't make it a point of conflict. So she's trying to help him practically. But then she goes on and she addresses specifically these two ideas. She says, your ideas on the two subjects you mentioned do not harmonize with the light which God has given me. The nature of the Holy Spirit is a mystery, not clearly revealed, and you will never be able to explain it to others because the Lord has not revealed it to you. She then quotes, now this is an important point, she quotes John 14, 16. So she quotes from John about the Holy Spirit and who the Holy Spirit is. So she says, it's a mystery, you don't understand it. And then she takes him to Scripture. And she goes on. And she says, this refers, speaking of John 14, 16, to the omniscience of the Spirit of Christ called the Comforter. And then she confesses her own limits of under human understanding. She says, quote, there are many mysteries which I do not seek to understand to explain, they are too high for me and too high for you. On some of these points, silence is golden. So her counsel to this man is, you need to be in unity and not create agitation and confusion in the church on things that are not clear. And then she continues and she says, what you're saying about the Holy Spirit, the Lord has shown me isn't right. It's a mystery you're speculating when you say he's Gabriel or whatever. And then she goes on and says, it's a mystery to me too. But what does Scripture say? And she takes him to Scripture. So this is her testimony here, in the absence, it seems, of explicit understanding herself on the personality of the Holy Spirit. Now this clarity, or this lack of clarity, shifted very quickly by 1893. So just in a couple years here, it changes. And we find her writing her first clear statement on the personality or personhood of the Holy Spirit in 1893. And she wrote this uh, here. I'll read it for you. There is altogether too little made of the work of the Holy Spirit's influence upon the church. The Holy Spirit is the comforter in Christ's name. He personifies Christ, yet is a distinct personality. We must have the Holy Spirit if we ask, we may have the Holy Spirit if we ask for it and make it a habit to turn to and trust in God rather than in any finite human agent who may make mistakes. So this in 1893 is her time where she's saying for the first time that I can find explicitly that the Holy Spirit is a personality. Yes, he personifies Christ, but he is a distinct personality of himself. She would go on and make many, many clear statements on the personality of the Holy Spirit. In 1896, she wrote, evil had been accumulating for centuries and could only be restrained and resisted by the mighty power of the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead. The third person of the Godhead. Who would come with no modified energy, but in the fullness of divine power. So here she's putting him in the context of the Godhead the third person of the Godhead. This particular statement in 1896, letter 8, 1896, is a part of a letter that she's writing to the brethren in America. She's in Australia at this time. So this is an open general letter to the church in America, to the ministers in America. It's an important letter. She's not writing it to just one person. She's writing it to the body of Christ in, in the United States there or in North America. It was published the next year in the, by the General Conference President, O.A. Olson, and circulated in Series A. And then in 1898, she publishes it with slight modifications in the book Desire of Ages. 
So the statement that we find in Desire of Ages, it's very close to this, really dates back to 1896, and it had a life in the church for about two years, including this letter that she's writing generally to, to those in North America. I would draw attention again now to what I was saying about her understanding in relation to Scripture. Because in this letter, this 1896 letter, she gives the scriptural antecedent of John 16, 7 and 8, where she says that Jesus said it was expedient that he go away. And then he would send the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, who would convict of sin and righteousness and judgment. So in the context of her presentation, she's still reverting to particularly John. It seems that before 1890s and after the 1890s, it's John 14 to 16 that Ellen White is often going back to as important and urgent and her scriptural basis that she's drawing from. Even while she has divine revelation, she is taking uh, the reader and the thinker, those who are considering things, to the Bible and not just articulating it herself, even though she is very clear in her personal statements. There are a number of statements that she makes in the 1890s and into the 1900s before her death on the Holy Spirit. Um, here's one in 1897. The prince of the power of evil can only be held in check by the power of God in the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit. So she's making this statement in different ways, in different contexts here. Another one, 1899. We have been brought together as a school, and we need to realize that the Holy Spirit, who is as much a person as God is a person, is walking through these grounds unseen by human eyes, that the Lord God is our keeper and helper. He hears every word we utter and knows every thought of the mind. So here she's even personifying the Holy Spirit as walking through the grounds and is very clear on his personhood. These, these and many other statements uh, are made by Ellen White. In 1900, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, man is laid in his watery grave. She's talking about baptism. Buried with Christ in baptism and raised from the water to live the new life of loyalty to God. The three great powers in heaven are witnesses that are invisible but present. The work is laid out before every soul and has acknowledged that has acknowledged his faith in Jesus Christ by baptism and has become a receiver of the pledge from the three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. She goes on to refer to Jesus and the, or the three persons of the Godhead in different ways. They're persons. She talks about them as powers. She talks about them as distinct agencies. She talks about them as eternal heavenly dignitaries. She's just finding different ways to say the same thing, that they are three persons. And she uses different phrases and different nuances in different settings at various times to make these statements over and over again. I'll refrain from reading further statements. Um, you can do, the, do that uh, yourself. Just do some keyword searches. It's a very uh, enlightening and helpful process. I want to look at three issues, though, uh, now that I think we've established clearly Ellen White's view and understanding that we need to consider as it relates to Ellen White and the Holy Spirit. One of them is that Ellen White understood the Holy Spirit as a person, but also representing Jesus. So she's clear that the Holy Spirit is a person, but like John says, where Jesus describes, he says, I will come to you there in John. And through the Holy Spirit, she has this view of the Holy Spirit also bringing Jesus. So she keeps the personification of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit being the person who brings Jesus to us in tension in her thinking. Uh, let me read this one statement, which is very interesting. Although our Lord ascended from earth to heaven, the Holy Spirit was appointed as his representative among men. And then again, she quotes John. She quotes John 14, 15 to 16, 15 to 18, I mean. And then she continued, quote, 
Cumbered with humanity, Christ could not be in every place personally. Therefore, it was altogether for their advantage that he should leave them, go to his Father, and send the Holy Spirit to be his successor on earth. The Holy Spirit is himself, and this is where sometimes people get confused, but it's not confusing. The Holy Spirit is himself divested of the personality of humanity and independent thereof. He would represent himself, Jesus would, as present in all places by his Holy Spirit as the omnipresent. So himself here is Jesus. So she's putting in tension this reality that the Holy Spirit is a person, but that Jesus is brought to us personally by the Holy Spirit. It's part of this mystery of the unity, the oneness of the Godhead that is a part of the beauty of, our, of the plan of salvation. So she's careful to keep that nuance of the Holy Spirit still bringing Jesus to us. So Jesus is with us through the Holy Spirit, but yet the Holy Spirit retains his personality or his personhood. A second consideration is an issue that relates to Ellen White and the Holy Spirit that we can consider is her use of the word it and he. This is very interesting. Um, as I mentioned earlier in this outline, J.H. Wagner would refer to the Holy Spirit as an it. And when he explains what he's talking about, he's not accepting the personality or the personhood of the Holy Spirit. Now, in 1936, H.C. Lacey claimed that uh, Ellen White started using the word he for the Holy Spirit because he said she heard him speak in 1895 at a series of early morning Bible studies, and therefore he was the one that caused her to start calling the Holy Spirit a he. Well, this is an interesting thing because when you do a careful word study, you find that Ellen White is making statements before 1893 where she is referring to the Holy Spirit as a he. Yes, she sometimes refers to it as an it, but she's also referring to the Holy Spirit as a he before 1893, even lay before Lacey's talk. What's interesting is, is even afterwards in the 1890s and 1900s, later in her life, she continues to refer to the Holy Spirit both as a he and an it. She's not trying to depersonify the Holy Spirit. It's simply a language usage that she's doing. So this has caused some cognitive dissonance and confusion for some people because they read Lacey's statement and they say, well, if that, isn't that amazing? That must be true. It's, we need to go back and we need to read what Ellen White wrote herself. A third issue um, that I want to mention is the veracity of Ellen White's statements on the Holy Spirit. Uh, Tim Poyer, Vice Director of the White Estate, published a very helpful paper in the year 2006 that traced back several key statements by Ellen White on the Holy Spirit to their original sources. And we can't repeat all of that, that here, but I want to take us to a couple of these statements and just show something here and say something a little bit about the veracity of her writings, her own writings. We do have original drafts for four of the statements that I've used in my descriptions here and my explanation in this paper. And this is an example of Manuscript 93, 1893, where Ellen White is first describing the Holy Spirit as having a personality. And you can see underlined here, it's hard to see on the screen, but it says here, you see the words, um, a distinct personality. She's talking about the Holy Spirit. So in the original handwriting, we, which we have, she is actually saying in this first statement that we have, uh, in her own hand, the very thing that we read. That's a pretty strong veracity if she's actually writing it herself. So you're looking at, uh, on a screen at least, um, the picture of a part of this manuscript, 93, 1893, where she says, that uh, the Holy Spirit is personifying Christ, yet is a distinct personality. Uh, I'm quoting it here. Another one of the manuscripts is Manuscript 20, 1906. And it, 
it, at the very top, you see some writing here, and it's hard to read on the screen, but uh, she writes at the top these words, I have read this carefully and accept it. And so, where she is speaking very clearly of the personality of the Holy Spirit and the Trinity, or the Godhead, um, she is writing at the top of this manuscript that she's read it carefully and accepted it. Now, as you look through this manuscript and you go to the next page, or another page, you find that she is actually interlineating. Here's an interlineation. Um, there's another one down here with her own hand, which shows that she's actually gone through this manuscript. Not only is she writing that she approves it, but she actually is marking in the manuscript itself. And then when you come to the end of the manuscript, she signs it. This is not a stamped signature. If you look at the original, you can see clearly she's personally signed this. So uh, with the handwritten originals, and then you have the, where we have handwritten originals, and where you have these types of original copies, I think it establishes really beyond question that Ellen White actually wrote what she wrote on these issues. We can actually go back to the primary sources and um, at least in, in some cases to the handwritten original, but in most cases back at least to an original copy that was done during her lifetime that she actually handled and interacted with, which I think is important because some who have not wanted to accept this understanding has said, well, Ellen White must not have really said that. Um, unfortunately for, for, for them, I would say you, need, you have to be respectful of the original manuscripts, and we need to look at that, look at that carefully. As we press the conclusion here, I would like to um, review just a couple of points about Ellen White and just restate what we've looked at here. During the earliest years, up to about 1890, Ellen White does not make explicit statements on the personality of the Holy Spirit. But she does speak very tangibly about the personality of the Father and the Son. She speaks very concretely and personally about the work of the Holy Spirit and the reality of the Holy Spirit in her own experience and is uh, strongly interacting with those who would reject that tangibleness of the Holy Spirit. And then, uh, finally, she is defaulting to Scripture. And we find in that one testimony that I mentioned that she had to this minister in 1891, that while she even herself understood some things as a mystery, that it would be better to be silent until we understand, and then she's quoting Scripture, and she's saying we need to go to Scripture. After the 1890s, she is more explicit, 1893, that first statement, and then later she's explicit. But she's still taking us back to Scripture, particularly John 14 to 16. So as we look at Ellen White and the Holy Spirit, we find that she is pushing us to the Bible, and she wants us to keep studying the Bible. So the dividing period is the 1890s, 1893, where she is speaking very explicitly on the personality of the Holy Spirit. Ellen White wrote regarding her writings, her prophetic role in relation to Scripture, some very clear words. And I think I'd like to end on this point. In her first tract that she published in 1851, she said, I recommend to you, dear reader, the Word of God as the rule of your faith and practice. She's taking people in her writings to Scripture. And on many occasions, she wrote of the relationship of her writings to the Bible. And one of her clearest statements that she wrote in Testimonies, Volume 8, page 236, she said, I have a work of great responsibility to do to impart by pen and voice the instruction given me, not alone to Seventh-day Adventists, but to the world. I have published many books, large and small, and some of these have been translated into several languages. This is my work, and then she says it, to open the scriptures to others as God has opened them to me. So we've in a way applied this principle of Ellen White's writings in relationship to Scripture to 
her own understanding of the Holy Spirit and the interaction between divine revelation that she received through visions and dreams and her focus upon the Bible and the importance of Scripture. And it has come to, caused me to have a great respect and appreciation for Ellen White. She's in a different category in her writings than other pioneers in the 1890s on this issue. God helps her somehow to refrain in the absence of her full understanding of things from making statements that would be counter to the Word of God and instead taking us to the Bible. And then when she has clear understanding, again, she's taking us to the Bible. Well, may God help us as we continue to study the Bible to understand Ellen White and her role in relation to Scripture and also to understand the vital importance of the personality of the Holy Spirit, both in the writings of Ellen White and in Scripture.